Hello, this is Daniel Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide. And today I'd like to do another talk about an upcoming technology that you have no doubt been hearing a lot about, and that is the Gen 12 renderer, and along with it, the talk of support for the Vulkan graphics interface. Plus, all the talk about the metallic and organic shaders. And like my prior video, my goal is to do it from the perspective of the player. Back in the days of the first Wing Commander games, programmers had to figure out how to talk to each of the, actually not that many, graphics cards out there. And your new card couldn't support your old game? Well, you hoped that there was a supported downgrade mode that would run it. So there were always calls for standards so that programmers could just program to the standards and it would work on a lot of cards. But which standard to choose? As an old saying goes, the best thing about standards is there's so many of them to choose from. And definitely many standards have come and gone but a few have had staying power. With Windows 95, Microsoft wanted game developers to really develop in Windows and not just use it as a launcher for their DOS programs. So they went wild with standards. Direct 3D, Direct Draw, Direct Play, Direct Sound, etc. All encapsulated under the umbrella DirectX, which is the source of the X in Xbox. Interesting aside, Microsoft Marketing came up with the name Xbox thinking it was the worst possible name for a console, so they can then use it as a baseline for testing all their much better ideas about how to name a console by how much consumers would like those better ideas over Xbox. But it turns out everything they thought of and tested consumer reaction to lost to Xbox. So Xbox it was. But DirectX remains a Microsoft standard intrinsically tied to Windows and the x86, now x64, instruction set and architecture. Meanwhile, the other big events in the graphics world were happening in the engineering workstations on the Unix platform. But that was a very fragmented landscape with several players, most of which no longer exist. One of them, Silicon Graphics, was the top dog. For example, this is how their flight simulator looked in 1985 with four persons network multiplayer. If you aren't impressed, this is what Microsoft Flight Simulator looked at the same time. Enough said. Anyhow, Silicon Graphics organized an industry group around a shared graphics standard and essentially donated their Iris GL as a starting point to form OpenGL in 1992. Microsoft eventually signed on to please software companies who wanted to program both for Windows and other platforms, such as Apple. So there was DirectX for Windows only programming and OpenGL for cross-platform programming, and all was well and good. The OpenGL Architecture Review Board of Companies merged with another industry nonprofit consortium, the Kronos Group, in 2006. Except that programmers like their interfaces that are, as they term it, close to the silicon. In other words, without adding a lot of overhead and abstraction to the actual features of the cards. And unfortunately, this is what the silicon looked like in 1998, supporting OpenGL 1 and DirectX 5. It has 4 megabytes, not gigabytes, of memory, 100 megahertz clock speed, and drew 4 watts of power. And it isn't just that things have become more powerful, they have become more powerful in entirely different ways. Intel wouldn't come up with a dual-core processor i86 until seven years later with the Pentium D and the thought of a graphics chip with 38 streaming processors and over 10,000 cores would have been unbelievable at that time. While the Kronos Group has tried to keep the OpenGL standard close to the silicon, with the silicon changing so rapidly in so many different ways, there was an increasing interest in shedding the legacy code and creating a new open standard for graphics. In 2015, Kronos announced the Next Generation OpenGL initiative, but rapidly changed its name to Vulcan because, well, it seems obvious that these guys like misspelling Star Trek planet names not to mention swooshy arch logos. AMD contributed much of what is new in Vulkan from a proprietary API named Mantle, which although well thought of, had little interest in because nobody wanted to make a game that only worked on one brand of graphics hardware. But one thing you might be wondering is, if CIG is interested in just making a PC game, why are they interested in the cross-platform standard? Why not just make the next generation renderer based on DirectX 12, keep it all Microsoft? One thing worth pointing out is that many games do offer a choice of DirectX or Vulkan drivers, so that may be what will happen with the Gen 12 renderer too. But clearly, CIG has placed great focus on the Vulkan driver, and I can only speculate as to why. But hey, nothing has stopped me from speculating in the past, so why stop now?
First of all, Vulcan is at the sweet spot of its product life cycle. Old enough to be certain that it's going to be here to last, but young enough that there is likely a long time before it is obsolete. If Vulcan has a comparable life cycle to OpenGL, it will still be mainstream for decades. Second, CIG may be interested in the Windows implementation, but cross-platform development is what the software industry as a whole is interested in, so Vulcan is the first thing that device and card manufacturers will put their attention to in their development. It is what schools will be teaching, and so it is what you will be able to hire people and find development partners that are strong in. And then there's the specific use case of Star Citizen's current architecture. Right now, people doing benchmarking on Star Citizen are saying that the client is CPU limited on a single thread and that that thread is involved with the rendering system. That is not to say that everything rendering wise is happening on a single thread, but that enough of the rendering task currently has to be done on a single thread that the rest of the game, including the other threads on those other cores, are waiting for it to finish, and that the GPU is typically waiting on the CPU and particularly on that one thread. So one of the main sales points in Vulkan is that it does a better job of distributing the computing workload across multiple core processors and in doing a better job of having certain workloads be delegated from the CPU to the GPU. In other words, solving the exact problem that Star Citizen seems to be having. Also worth mentioning is that one of the stated strengths of Vulkan is being able to include multiple shaders in a single scene. And that is exactly the case of Star Citizen, where CIG is creating a new metallic shader, organic shader, and I wouldn't at all be surprised to see a gaseous shader before we are done with cloud tech development. So what would all that boil down to from a gamer's perspective? Well, more and smoother frames from both medium and higher hardware. If you've been running at low settings because your hardware is struggling, you might have the ability to move to medium or high. Uh, but to be perfectly honest though, multiple tests have shown that for most monitors and resolutions, there is no discernible difference between high and the very high or ultra resolutions. But that brings up a second subject. What is a shader? Why would a game need more than one? And in the process, touch on why the whole graphics card market is so ridiculous right now. As you know, any physical object in the game, such as a sphere, is constructed of any number of polygons. These polygons are either wrapped in a bitmap or they are given a color value, say, blue. If they are simply drawn in that color, you don't see a sphere, you see a blue circle with a faceted edge. You need a module or code that will, based on the light source, calculate what shade of blue to make each one of those polygons. In other words, a shader. But of course it got more complicated than that pretty quickly. The first shaders used flat shading. Calculate the light hitting the center of the face and draw the entire facet in that color. It works, but as you see, the facets are quite evident and it looks like a polygon rather than a sphere like you would want it to. Now, you could respond by composing the sphere of so many polygons that you wouldn't notice, but for obvious reasons that is a bad idea. So instead they came up with algorithms calculating the brightness at each corner or each edge and then for each pixel average the shade based on the distance from the vertexes or edges. These were called edge or vertex shaders and the first and most famous ones were the Fong and Garou shaders. As you can see they are substantially more realistic and when graphics cards implemented those calculations in silicon it was a big deal. But which of these two is more realistic? Well. It depends on what you presume the sphere is made of, right? And that is the start of it. Different types of materials need a different algorithm at a very basic level to be shown realistically. So that is why you need multiple shaders in the same game. Am I saying that the core CIG's metallic and organic shaders have one being a vertex shader and the other an edge shader? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Those core algorithms are very long lived. But that is just the start of a flood of ideas about how to make surfaces more detailed without adding more polygons. Next was height maps, also known as bump maps, that could give surfaces all sorts of rough textures. Opacity maps to create surfaces with holes, specular maps to create surfaces with more and less shiny materials, and so on. The graphics card manufacturers couldn't keep up with implementing all of it in silicon, so they said that instead they would just make their cards into programmable computers that the game engine companies can then load their own shader programs onto at runtime 
rather than expect the card manufacturers to burn them into the silicon EEPROMs or include them in their drivers. And that is where shaders went from being part of the graphics card design to part of game design. And that is also where something else happened. It meant that since cards were now their own specialized, massively parallel computers, it meant that they didn't necessarily have to be programmed to calculate millions of pixel colors on a massively parallel basis to doing other things on a massively parallel basis, such as calculating cryptocurrency hashes. Oh yeah, that. And that is why a graphics card that was announced three years ago at $249 is now selling for three times that, and why a lot of people, myself included, are hanging on to their three-year-old graphics cards rather than entering literally a lottery to win the right to massively overpay for anything newer. I could get more into the crazy economics of this, but that would be an entirely different video if I chose to make it. Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.